30 years of the best sports talk in Middle Tennessee, featuring Tennessee Radio Hall of Famer George Plaster, Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame coach Watson Brown, and Young Guns, Billy Derrick. And now, here's your host, George Plaster. Hello again, everybody. Welcome in on a stormy Thursday in Nashville, Tennessee. Looks like it's going to continue for a while off and on. So beware, uh, depending on where you're driving, that it could get a little ugly. First of all, Watson Brown, not with us today, celebrating his 50th wedding anniversary. 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 50th wedding anniversary with his wife, Brenda, and we pass on our congratulations to both of them, and in particular, Brenda, putting up with him for 50 years. Good Lord. I love how he said married her at 12. <laughs> that was the best line. The more important Brown in the family. Absolutely. So let me say this before we get into any witty repartee. If you're a fan of of the Southeastern Conference, this is a day you need to be watching the show. It will be full of SEC kind of news. In the first hour, my buddy and former NC State Athletic Director Lee Fowler will join us solo, and we're going to get into all the machinery that will ultimately decide What teams are permanently linked to the others? Now, you're like, what does that mean? Okay, here's where I'm going. Now that the SEC knows that it's expanding to 16 by the calendar year 2024, who plays who? Who are the permanent opponents for each of the schools? For instance, does Tennessee get... Vandy? Do they get Kentucky? Do they get Alabama? This is the kind of stuff we're going to get into during the first hour. In the second hour, we're going to talk college basketball with the insiders. Lee Fowler again, Coach Ron Bargatze in front and center stage will be Tennessee's big win last night against number one ranked Alabama. By the way, if you're number one, apparently it's a curse. (laughs) <laughs> it's ridiculous. I I, I saw it's something crazy. on ESPN stats and info, George, about the AP number one teams uh, that no one has held it longer than something like a week. You know, they, they haven't gone multiple weeks yeah. as the number one team. And, it you know, we've had seasons like this before, but this one, it's another level uh, of parity. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. There are good teams. I don't know that we were that we're at the level of great. Um, as you know, I picked Tennessee last night and really didn't hesitate a lot about doing it. I thought they would give Alabama everything they wanted. And to be honest, at times they out-hustled Alabama. They really did, George. I mean, they they bullied them. They, they really – and you haven't seen anybody do that to Alabama this season, really. And the stat, I found it here, with Alabama's loss to Tennessee, there have now been eight losses by AP top uh, number one teams this season. That is tied for the most in a regular season in the AP poll era with the 1993 season. Yeah. So <laughs> that wow. tells you about the parity. But we start there. The update, George, Alabama – or I said Alabama. Tennessee knocks off Alabama 68-59. Their defense was unreal. Their first win over an AP number one team since beating Gonzaga in 2019. So they've done it before. They've got Kentucky on Saturday. Ooh. So I'd like to, I'd like to be at Rupp. Yeah. And Kentucky's going to be desperate. You think? (laughs) What makes you think that? eh, A little bubble talk. We'll get into that a little bit later. It got hairy last night in Starkville. See, that might have been a travel there late. Yeah. But uh, Kentucky got, got away. Hold on a second. There's no might. They've been to it. It was a travel. There was. Yeah. And did he walk? It, he did. 
and they were both on the bubble, George, Mississippi State and yeah. uh, Kentucky. So now they're, but we'll see where they are later. Yeah, the, show. the good news for both of them is there's still plenty of basketball to be played. Yeah. The bubble um, talk starts way too early anyway. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, first of all, this guy, Joe Lenardi, as I've said before, he's a humorless man. He sits in a cave for about four months churning out this crap. To me, I don't know. I mean, because there is a part of me that looks at it, especially if a team I'm interested in is is involved, it does seem like it starts a little early. If, if I don't give a damn in the summer about where he's got people projected. I just don't. I don't care about the next four out in, in December. <laughs> New Mexico State. <laughs> Uh, but that's where where the SEC basketball is at right now, George. The, it's the standings are crazy right now. That yeah. there's a lot of movement. Uh, we talked about Vandy; they could be uh, moving up with a win on Saturday against Auburn. I'm sure we'll talk more about that tomorrow. George, SEC media days. Nashville's getting excited about this. We're excited. Uh, of course, we'll be down there. They announced the appearance schedule at the annual media days, July 17th through the 20th. So the week after the all-star game and the home run derby. So, you know, we'll, we'll be able to watch that without distractions. This will be the first time for the event to be held in Nashville and only the third time for it to be outside the Birmingham area. So it's at the Grand Hyatt, not the convention center. Yes, it's at the Grand Hyatt uh, conve- convention center. They said Grand uh, Hyatt convention center, so uh, I don't the, know. The, the Grand Hyatt is a beautiful new hotel in downtown. Honk if you've heard that before. <laughs> So some coaches, uh, first day is a big day. Brian Kelly, Coach Drinkwitz, and Jimbo Fisher will be on Monday. Clark Lee will be Tuesday, and then Josh Heupel on Thursday. Yeah. So uh, we were stuff. We were asking about it the other day, and we got it. So we got the dates ready for SEC Media Days. George, in the, in the uh, college level at football, Nick Saban has hired Ken Wisenhunt to be an analyst, senior analyst, whatever you want to call it. Uh, obviously he's got a lot of experience in football at the college level. I'm not sure of his experience. Oh, I am. I've heard he coached at Vanderbilt. Sure. He did for a little bit. Sure. He did. Don't think I was alive. He dunked on me once. Did he really? We had a, we had a pickup game in Memorial gym and he dunked on me. (laughs) Um, Ken, um, was a terrific special teams coach under Rod Dalhauer in the first year that I was Vandy's play-by-play announcer, it was obvious to me that Ken Wisenhunt was going places. I will tell you that I've never been more shocked when it didn't work here with the Titans. Um, I just was. He had taken the Arizona Cardinals and a um, pretty good quarterback named Kurt Warner to the Super Bowl where they lost on the final drive to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so at the time that Wisenhunt got hired, I would have told you, and I think a lot of people thought this, that it would be a really good hire. In the moment, it sounded like a really good hire. And this is where you never know. Anyway, happy for him. He joins the Saban halfway house uh, for wayward coaches. And uh, my guess is that this will probably do him some good. It's very interesting what Saban has done. Um, you he know, ju- he's just doing whatever he wants. Well, yeah, I mean, he's earned that right because he knows he can. Yeah, he's earned that right. I mean, I'm not, I'm not shaming it. It's just interesting how. Oh, it's it's very interesting. The, the, I don't know if you'd say diversity, but you know, the variety of different coaches. You know, you had Bill O'Brien last year. You had who was the DC last Pete Golding, uh, you know. So it, who went to Ole Miss? Right. You never know who's going to come in, who's going to leave. It's almost like they're doing well, this had, every year. He's had Lane Kiffin. He's had Sarkeesian. What's even more impressive about it, he's, though, George? He's had Butch Davis. Yeah. What's even more impressive, I think, though, is where these coaches have landed after. Oh, sure. They, they spent time with Nick Saban. It's almost a guaranteed ticket. Yeah to some form of of head coaching down the road. It's a chance to sort of revive your career a little bit. It yeah, seems I like. mean, think about it. Um, Kiffin landed first at uh, FAU mm-hmm. and then at Ole Miss. Uh, run through a few of those Butch, names. Butch Jones, who Butch is, Jones. At, is at Arkansas State now. Yes. Not doing particularly well, but, you know, he got a head coaching job. Right. 
he had a little more rehabilitation to yeah. do. And George, Bill O'Brien is able to go back to the Patriots, you know, and, and become their OC. Obviously, Belichick and Saban are really close, so you just never know what, what's going to happen with these coaches. You know, the thing on Bill O'Brien, um, when he became, and this was a little bit of a power play in Houston, where he became both the coach and the GM, and the GM part of him was miserable. He was awful. I don't know that many many coaches would like doing that. I mean, when has it worked? Uh, seldom, but I think to some level, um, you I know, just, I, I don't know. I to mean, some level, Belichick's doing that, right? And I'm sure there's other coaches who knows what level Vrabel's doing it right now. Um, you know, I just as a as a football guy, I don't know how much of a uh, a GM role you would want to have. The uh, the, the deal that got Bill O'Brien in the most trouble was the DeAndre Hopkins trade to Arizona. He, he in my opinion, gave him away, and I don't get that. I, that Nobody got that, the, by the way. For the life of me, I will never understand that. Nobody. Nobody. George, last piece here on a somber note. I feel like I always do this, but I think this needs to be mentioned. Tim McCarver, Hall of Fame broadcaster and, uh, of course, former major leaguer, has passed away at the age of 81. Uh, he was a two-time World Series champ, two-time All-Star catcher. He played 21 seasons. Sure did. In the major leagues and was a great color analyst. Really you know, good color analyst. He and uh, he and the late Jack Buck, uh, who both had St. Louis Cardinal ties, um, were a very effective broadcast team. Now, unfortunately, McCarver maybe is well known for the fact that Deion Sanders dumped a big old bucket of water on him. And the deal was, if I remember correctly, McCarver was critical of Deion Sanders trying to play both NFL football and Atlanta Braves postseason baseball at the same, at the time. same time. And the whole thing sort of blew up on a Sunday. And the Braves, if I remember correctly, didn't know that Dion was going to play in the NFL game down in Miami at noon against the Dolphins and then fly up on a private plane for that night's whatever it was, game yeah. five or or what game two. I don't, Playoff game. Against the Pirates uh, in, in a series that I went to a bunch of those games, not the ones in Pittsburgh, but went to virtually all of them in Atlanta. And so – McCarver was very critical of Dion, and after the game, Dion dumped a, a big uh, bucket of water on him. And uh, unfortunately, would, that got him a lot of notoriety. He was a terrific broadcaster. Was that universally criticized, that Dion Sanders move? Not not just him trying to play baseball, but that yeah. timing of the playoffs. and what, Were there a lot of people critical of him? Yeah, and I think, look, for me as a Braves fan, I mean, if he was going to do that, he needed to inform them of that decision. So he didn't let them know. No, he didn't let them know. If I, if memory serves me correctly, they did not know. <laughs> and so when it's... the game began down in Miami, oops, there's Dion. This sounds like Dion. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Obviously, I didn't know. How'd that work out? Not well. But George, obviously, I don't know much about him when he was a player. But that sounds like the McCar. Uh, well, I'll I'll say this: McCarver, McCarver, and Bob Gibson were a great uh, battery duo, pitcher catcher in St. Louis. Did McCarver do games with Joe Buck later on? He Fox? did later, okay. but but his his what he's most known for Jack was the legendary Jack Buck, who I will claim is the best radio baseball announcer that was ever put on earth, including Vin Scully. I think when Jack Buck turned it on, mm. when he'd give you that swing and a hit, sorry, <laughs> when he did that over KMOX, it didn't get any better no. in baseball broadcasting. Speaking of not getting any better, obviously we missed Chip Carey, and you go back to the legendary Skip Carey, of yep. course, who was a great broadcaster as well. The Braves have brought in Brandon Godden. Right, and I don't know a lot about Brandon. He did Georgia Tech football uh, for a while. I think basketball as well. Uh, after West really? Durham, really took okay. over. I think for West Durham, and he's a lifelong Braves fan. 
Okay. Grew up in the in that Atlanta yeah. area, and this is a dream job for Good him. Good for him. So, and Good he's got him. a phenomenal voice too. By the yeah. way, yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I see Sluggo Lee Fowler in the on deck circle. He just gave me a thumbs up, so I'll give him one as well. We've got a lot to cover, and let me just say this: if you're an SEC fan, this is a show you're gonna want to hear. So stick around. Tell your friends, find a thousand of them before we get back on the George Plaster Show. How am I going to get to work? My car's totaled. Scholar, our team is making a call right now. We'll get you a rental car. Don't worry. That's a relief. Call us 24-7. We're here. We're going to help. Year number two of the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night was awesome. And the reason is really simple. I chose Strike and Spare, and they were amazing. They have great food, great bowling, and a staff that is truly ready to go the extra mile to help you. They have five family fun centers in the area to choose from. And for more info, go to strikeandspare.com or call them at 615-824-5685. We are excited to announce that the Music City Saints baseball program will host a spring golf scramble for their Baseball with Buds scholarship program. This program is in memory of a program supporter who passed away last summer. The scholarship program ensures every kid with the ability and drive for the game of baseball gets caught up due to the cost of competitive summer baseball. Tee off is at 8 a.m. on Saturday, March the 18th at Ted Rhodes Golf Course in Nashville. The scramble will include 18 holes of golf with a cart provided and unlimited food and drink. Registration for each four-person team is $400 that includes drinks during the event. They will also be providing lunch for each team. They're limited to 25 teams, so sign up soon. If you can't field a full team, individual registration works also. Finally, if you're unable to take part in the golf scramble on Saturday, March the 18th, but you'd like to support the Music City Saints, you can help their program with a one-time donation. If you have or know of any businesses that would like to become sponsors of Music City Saints Baseball, feel free to contact Chan with any questions or to register. The phone number is area code 270-300-4155 or you can go to musiccitybaseball24 at gmail.com. As the trusted premier custom home builder in Middle Tennessee, Donnelly Timmons has over 20 years of experience in the industry. Whether you're looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client and every remodel is unique, luxurious, and completed on time within budget. Founders Dustin Timmons and Joey Donnelly have over 25 years of construction experience in the Nashville area. Together, they have completed projects in Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Green Hills, Franklin, and Brentwood. Dustin and Joey believe that communication is the most important aspect of all construction projects. Therefore, they personally manage each project themselves and are involved in job site activities on a daily basis. Their commitment to quality and integrity has earned them an outstanding reputation among their clients. Contact them to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects. Give them a call at 615-456-7983 or log on to DonleyTimmons.com. By the way, I guess that music is going away because That's CBS. A tragedy. Yeah. The, the big the Big Ten owns that now. Yeah. They're going to be playing it during big before Big Ten games. 
Uh, I wonder about that. They need to switch it. Yeah. I'll say this. Come up with, come up with your own song, Big when they When they would play that at 2.30, oh, my <laughs> God. It got all the blood going. It's officially a Saturday. So if you're an SEC fan, this is definitely a show you're going to want to listen to. Our buddy, former NC State Athletic Director Lee Fowler, joins us during this first hour. He'll be on the entire time pinch hitting for Watson Brown, who is celebrating his 50th wedding anniversary today. Watson, how about that? I mean, uh, Lee, how about that? I think it's wonderful. I'm I'm celebrating in May my 39th, so so he's, Watson's been at it a little longer. Carol's put up with you that long? Yeah, she's a blessed woman, George. My, no, no, she's the same, <laughs> actually. Let's just be honest here. So there's a lot of talk right now. Once, um, once the SEC and Oklahoma and Texas were able to work all their stuff out with Fox and ESPN, and now we know they're coming in in 2024, the question becomes, how do you schedule and secondly, who become the opponents for each school that they know they're going to play every year, no matter what? So, Lee, let me start with this. You're really wired to this kind of stuff. They're going nine conference games, aren't they? Well, I mean, they have to make that decision first. It, it makes it easier to play everybody in the league every four years, George, and and it just it's it's a great, better multiple plus other two conferences have already gone it gone to nine games, so I'd be shocked if they didn't. They're probably smart not to have done it until they needed to for this process, because there's going to be a lot more money in it because the games that they're going to be adding will have Oklahoma and Texas in them, or some of them. So that'll mean a lot more money from the TV networks. Do TV networks? basically tell a league look we're telling you what to do this is what you do they don't really do that george they, they, they will tell you what it's worth if, if so-and-so plays so-and-so and and so they don't really tell you you got to do this but you understand that when you add teams like texas and oklahoma they're going to want as many of those games as they can and the way to do that's to add another game gives them more opportunities to, to do it. And I, I think that that it's going to be quite a payday for the SEC with those two teams being added. And, of course, you don't ever do something like this when we expanded in the, in the ACC unless it's going to mean more per school. And, you know, as you get up in these big numbers of 16, going 14 to 16, you really have to have some people that are going to add a lot to the bottom line to get that to happen. So – a lot of things happened before this was ever announced. You don't know what was what was agreed to before this was announced, George. It'll be interesting. Love to be a fly on the wall down in Destin this year when they meet in the spring meetings to settle all this. But I'm sure to to get Oklahoma and Texas into the league, they had to get three quarters of their members, 14 members, to vote for it. So at that point, if they had enough to do that and didn't have to give up anything or promise anybody anything that happened. But if they did, somebody might have said, I'll be glad to do this, but I want to make sure I still play Alabama in whatever scheduling deal we do, or I'll vote for it if this happens or that happens. So some of that stuff probably went on before they voted them in. And, and now the real issues will be with a less of a vote to make it happen. Cause now it'll be uh, two thirds instead of three quarters to, to set the schedules up. So you're saying all this will go down and we will know at the end of the spring meetings down in Destin. If, if they announce it after, right after spring meetings, usually you have a readout of what happens on, in, a, in a major conference like that and let you know uh, what's happened at that meeting. Now, they may not get it all resolved and they may keep a little bit not resolved because they're not ready to announce it uh, because they'll also need to negotiate I'm sure their rights people will be there. They always are. Uh, I don't know what year it is that, that they're negotiating or whether they have any coming up soon, but this is definitely a, a position that you would want them there 
and there'll be conversations going on with the rights holder while they're talking about what they're thinking about doing. So not that the rights holders say you got to do this, you got to do that, but they'll give them what's worth more to them, what means more to them as they're going through the process. So Lee, you've gone through this when you were the athletic director at NC state kind of give people a little bit of a sense of the backroom wheeling and dealing that really goes on as this stuff gets figured out. Well, I, I think that, that in our situation, we had nine schools. You had to have seven of them uh, vote for it. We knew Duke and Carolina was not going to vote for expansion. They had publicly said they weren't. So somebody was going to make that seventh vote or not make that seventh vote. And, and so uh, we were the one of the schools. Wake Forest was one of the schools. The rest of them wanted to expand. And we, we were able to guarantee ourselves to play Carolina during that process. And I'm sure some things like that happened in the SEC, not knowing what they were. Um, we would have probably played them anyway, but we wanted to make sure that happened if we were going to expand and bring a bunch of new teams in. So I'm sure that sort of stuff happened. I think that, that there's a lot of conversations going on with your friends in the league, with like people in the league that you feel like you're, you know, you're in the bottom six with the other, uh, other schools and some schools are for expansion. Some schools aren't, uh, if you can guarantee them they're more money, then they probably don't have much of a issue with it, but you still got to worry about your fan base, who they want to play. And, and so all that stuff's kind of going on. And, and George, the funny part there, there, there's usually a lot different public persona with people than there were behind the scenes. Uh, <laughs> I as bet. you can well imagine at that point, I mean, nobody th thought Wake Forest going to be very good. Well, two years after we did all this, they won the league in football. So it's, it's a hard thing to imagine what's going to happen in the future. And I don't think you ever can, but you kind of, are, are driven by what's gone on in the past. So it, it'll be very interesting. It'll be tough meetings, I would think, in the room because everybody wants exactly what they want and you can't end up that way because it just isn't going to happen for people. So there'll be a lot of conversation going on, a lot of breaks, a lot of people getting together at night, having dinner together, talking about what they need. And, and, and so it, it'll be an interesting process, but you know, with the product the SEC has, it's, it's not going to end up poorly for anybody, no matter what happens. And some people have more power than others. It's just, it's a way of life. And it definitely is in conferences also. We're going to do two things as part of this. The first thing we're going to do is I put a list together this morning that I gave Billy to create a graphic with, and it was basically entitled games that should not go away. No league has more tradition, more, you know, old time stuff to get through than the SEC does. You know, I'm hard pressed to believe that Oregon State and Stanford has quite the same level of passion that some of these games that I've put together on this list will have. So, Billy, let's run through those real quickly. Okay. Lee, I'm assuming that they're smart enough not to screw with Alabama Auburn. You got to believe that'll be the case. Number two, this is the Cotton Bowl game where they divide the stadium in half. Oklahoma has 50 yard line to other 50 yard line. Texas has the orange, and you got a bunch of little J.R. Ewing wannabes in the stadium. <laughs> around the Texas State Fairgrounds. <laughs> and, and George, as you're making these comments, you got to realize that the fans want this. And guess what? The TVs want these games. Sure they, they, they do. definitely want it. and going to pay a lot more for that game than they are for something else. Okay. This one, I want to get your opinion on because A&M for years has felt like the bastard stepchild to Texas. And when AM made the, the big leap, all of a sudden they became more top dog. And Ross Bjork, who I've known for years, the AD at AM, basically said, Texas will join this league over my dead body. 
with that in the backdrop, do you think that game is one of those that can't go away? Well, I don't know if it can't, but Texas A&M can definitely not say they don't want to play Texas in public. Now, private, that may be the case. They would rather not play them. But in public, they'll have to say that. And I thought what was so funny when when uh, they did, Texas A&M came out and said over his dead body, well, I thought that might happen the next day because the right. next day he was happy that Texas was coming in the league after the governor said, we will, Texas will go in the SEC if they want to. So I Ross, had, that. a, That's Ross right. had what we'll call an attitude adjustment. Yes, he did. And, and we all have had those. Yes. Some of us bigger than others, but uh, I, I was shocked that he said that because I knew the the politics in Texas was not going to like that at all. A lot of J.R. Ewing wannabes in that game as well. Yes. Okay, here's one that has been a staple of CBS primetime the first weekend in November. And in particular, when that, this game has been in Baton Rouge, man, has it gotten eyeballs. Yeah, I think it's a big game. It's a, you know, it's one of those Alabama, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, LSU. Yeah, I think that that's a game that no, both those teams would like that to stay on their schedule. Again, these are just one person's opinion, mine, of games that cannot go away. You know, it's funny, Billy, that you put that on there because that's what I was thinking. These two teams, this is the oldest rivalry in Southern college football, Auburn, Georgia. Lee, does this one go away? Well, I think it could, but uh, we, you could make it where they don't have to. I mean, Georgia's got to play three schools, and uh, at least if they go to a pod system, which we'll talk about later. So, yes and no. I mean, but I'm not sure that's, that's, not, that, that's not as good as the ones you mentioned before, all the ones you brought up before. George, it, let me butt in here real quick. I, when when the SEC looks at these matchups, Lee, Auburn's a little down. Do you think they consider the trajectory of a program? Like, say Auburn was contending for a national title uh, for the past few years. Do you think they will consider that and maybe throw it out the window, especially if there's, there's you know, Georgia will have a lot of uh, contenders for, for their, their three permanent opponents. Do you think they take that into account, how a team has, has looked on the field? Uh, probably not. The SEC, believe it or not, will have very little to say about this. It'll be what Georgia wants, and, and but everybody won't get their top three choices. Everybody will get maybe their top choice to play. And, um, you know, I've got to have, let's say Georgia, Florida, that's a huge game at this point in time. So I've got to have that one. And if that's the case, then they may not get their second choice, but after winning two national championships, they probably will get their second choice. So is Auburn that? I could see where it could be. So so it's going to be it's going to be a lot of give and take and it's not going to really be what the league wants uh until the league has to make the decision and you hope that doesn't come down to that you hope that that everybody will decide and be okay with what's going on and as I said George you know uh Tennessee probably wants to play Alabama but do you really want to play Alabama every year <laughs> so yes you want that game but you know, behind the scenes, is that something you fight for? Probably, uh, if you if that's your one choice. Uh, so, it, it's an interesting process. There's a lot of grown men. There's not a lot of cigar smoking in that room. I can promise you. But there's a lot of issues, and and, and I probably thought more than anything else, there were a lot of break, breaks taken during. You know, usually you'll go an hour, an hour and a half in meetings. But in these things, sometimes you go 10 minutes, it gets a little heated. So let's just take a break for five or 10 minutes, come back <laughs> after that. So everybody cools down. And uh, so, so it'll be very interesting. And I'm sure the, the, the good part about it, you can't hardly mess it up. I mean, they've got so many good products uh, that fans will be upset and you want everybody to, to be happy, but everybody won't be happy. But I think that Auburn, Georgia would, has a good chance of being one of the three people they play every year. Okay, I'm five down, five more to go. I believe that Jack Daniels and Cuddy Sark will have their lobbyists pushing <laughs> the SEC to continue this. There is more booze consumed at that game. Maybe Texas OU 
would rival it. But Georgia, Florida, after all, is the world's largest cocktail party. Yeah, they've tried to change that name, but but the, but it hadn't changed in the stands. It's still the same way. And and that, I've, I've got to believe that that's Georgia and Florida's number one game that they both have to have. And, um, you know, so I think that game will go on. Neutral site, Gator Bowl in Jacksonville, much like Texas OU, half the stadium is Florida, half the stadium is Georgia. When it's over, take a look at all the whiskey bottles. There are a bunch of them. A lot of miniatures, George. A lot of miniatures. My hey, dad. If you were in the athletic world, I had to enlarge my uh, <laughs> Johns where they would flush miniatures instead of stop them up at Carter Finley Stadium. So I know a lot about that. So it's not just hiring coaches and other things you have to deal with in college administration. There's certainly some info you wouldn't get anywhere else. That's right. Um, here's one that. Remember when they played, what was this, a seven-overtime game? It ended up 74-72. They're really not very far from each other, and so I put that one in there. And they've tried to really make this a rivalry with, yeah. with A&M coming in. Yeah. Well, and Jimbo has contacts both places uh, as far as Jimbo Fisher is uh, is there. So it, it's, it's, it's definitely a game. You know, at that league, it's not so much about – uh, being close together because they fly everywhere, but their fans definitely like it when they see each other on a day-to-day basis. Okay, here's one that's just an ugly rivalry, Egg Bowl. And in truth, as I was trying to th- think through, <clears throat> excuse me, Ole Miss and Mississippi State, this is the one. That's the that's their game. They've got to have that. The state would go crazy if they didn't. So that's an easy one. Um, you know, the probably tougher ones. Some of your ones, the the the, the game they have to have is harder than the ones they don't have to have. And, and filling the other two will be something that they'll be upset about if they don't get somebody else or this person or that person. Okay, what do you believe are the odds that Tennessee Alabama continues? I think it'll continue. Okay. How about this one? This is an this is turned much milder, this final one in recent years because Florida hadn't been anywhere near as good. But this was a rivalry where Steve Spurrier once said, um can't spell citrus without UT. Without UT. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So what do you think are the odds of Tennessee, Florida? Uh, I think there's a possibility, but it's probably down to third on Tennessee's. That'd be the third game they'd get, I would think. I think that, that uh, believe it or not, George, I think Vanderbilt, Tennessee will be a game that'll be one of Tennessee's games. Uh, it's in state, you know, the, all the things that yeah. make it easier. So Florida may be the, the third one, but I'm not sure that'll be the third one. Because you also got Kentucky as Kentucky, well. Kentucky, Tennessee also. So you got. Yeah that issue let's do this we're going to go to the break lee i'm going to have you later on read out what you think is coming down we weren't able to put the graphic together in time and so i'm going to have you read this from your palatial mansion (laughs) all right we'll do that then we'll discuss each one as i read the the four teams that'll play each other okay if you're an sec fan you want to hear this This is what's going to get decided in Destin. How do they schedule football? God forbid your team isn't on the right list. Stay tuned. I know, it's getting colder, you're not thinking about golf. However, if you're planning an event for next year, let me suggest golf through Riverside Golf Links. The course has improved dramatically. It's perfect for hosting a corporate or a charitable outing. They've got everything in place to make your event a rousing success. To get more info, call 615-847-5074 or go online to riversidegolflinks.com.
Hockey in Music City just hits different. It's one big honky-tonk party. It's the sea of gold in the crowd. The goals, the saves, the celebrations. It's an experience like no other. Don't miss a minute of the action this season. Visit NashvillePredators.com slash tickets to get your seats today. That's NashvillePredators.com slash tickets. And we'll see you at Brimstone Arena. Jody Jones has as nice a dental facility as you'll find anywhere. Let's go in and take a look. Are you in the market for a new dentist? Maybe you're new to Nashville? Well, the place to go is Jody Jones Dentistry at 55 Music Square East, and their new facility is absolutely state of the art. Jody mixes quality with comfort for the perfect dental experience. He's trusted for his creative design and committed to both the function and aesthetics of your smile. Jody is simply the total package. Don't wait, make an appointment now at 615-259-5100. We're back, and as all of you know, the Southeastern Conference now has the answers. Texas and OU are joining the league to start 2024 after the negotiations with Fox and ESPN produced a deal. Next up is how do you schedule through this? And what we're going to do in a minute, Billy is going to read what Lee has sent us is his best guess. It's probably got a little more than best guess to it. This just in. That guy on the right, pretty well wired. But he still has to admit to people, he was once my color analyst. That's right. That doesn't help him. <laughs> so, Lee, let me, let me make sure I'm right. It will be, in your opinion, three that are permanent, correct? Three that are permanent for the first four years, at least. Uh, you have to play nine conference games to do this. And then you play uh, six teams home and away the next, the first two years, and then rotate the other six in for the next two years. So uh, the good thing about it for teams that, that have home crowds is that you play everybody in the league over four years, which I think is very positive. And, and I think that that helps crowds. It helps build your fan base. That's, that's very uh, positive with this many teams to be able to see everybody over a four year period. Okay. George, you know, Georgia and Alabama played twice in 15 years, I think, with the, Such old, a shame. the old schedule. That's going to change for the better. Yeah. Okay. Billy, uh, what's the first school up? Speaking of Alabama, we'll start there. Alabama. Yes, indeedy. Here's what Lee's got for their three permanent opponents starting in 2024. Auburn, LSU, and Tennessee. Okay, so he's got the three games that I listed in my games that should not go away, and you think that's the way it's going down? I think so. You, you would probably think Saban said, well, that's a whole lot tougher schedule than other people have got. But then again, you know, he's been playing Auburn and LSU and Tennessee anyway, so it's not like it's new to him, uh, but, but that's the kind of – things you're going to be dealing with as an AD trying to make his coach happy and his coach saying, you know, I'd rather play Missouri than LSU or maybe rather play, I don't know, Vanderbilt than LSU. So, so those are the kind of things behind the scenes that you're dealing with to trying to get these schedules put together. But I think that's where it'll end up. I think that, that, that other teams are okay with that and Auburn and LSU and Tennessee have been playing them the whole their whole existence so what's next arkansas arkansas has got texas lsu and missouri and, and and i think that george because of of i think arkansas wants to play texas i, I think they they need texas because that's where they used to have their recruiting base when they were really good it so, also was a de facto national title game 
in the late 60s that President Nixon attended. Yeah. So I, I think that LSU is good for them. Missouri is close. So I think that makes a good pod for them also. By the way, Nixon at that game said, and I quote, I am not a crook. <laughs> Watergate is not. That didn't happen. <laughs> Except it's going to happen five years from now. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. All right, let's get to Auburn. <laughs> Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi State. Hmm. Okay, the first two, I get why Mississippi State? Well, Mississippi State's got to play somebody. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you're going to start putting people in there that's probably not what Auburn would want for their third. But location-wise, uh, it's been they've been in the West together. They've got some sort of rivalry built. So, I just think that, you know, at some point that starts happening pretty quickly. And if you don't like it, you can play UL Monroe. Yeah, that's right. You've always got them. Okay, next Florida, we go to the East. Cocktail party with Georgia, mm -hmm. South Carolina, and Kentucky. Oh, so you've kept Tennessee out of there. Well, I mean, you can't play, you know, you only play three, so I'm not sure that. Do you really, if you're Tennessee, want to play Tennessee and Georgia every year? You mean uh, Florida and Georgia? Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just don't know that you want to do that every year, but. Publicly, you want to say that. You're mad that you didn't get it, but I'm not sure that's the case if you want to be competitive. All right, let's go to Georgia. Auburn, Florida, and South Carolina. Makes sense. Yeah. Pretty good? Yeah, because there was a time before Georgia got really good that the Georgia-South Carolina border war was nasty. Yeah, it was great. It was yeah. great. Fans love it. Let's go to the Commonwealth, Kentucky. Tennessee, Vandy, first appearance for the Doors, and Florida. Yeah, I, I just think that that uh, Florida, Kentucky, some people don't realize, but that's always been an unbelievable mm -hmm. game when they play each other. And once again, you start getting games that you may scratch your head and say, well, why that one? But that's kind of, you know, UK's got to feel good about what they're getting also. So that, those are the kind of things that, uh, it is like you say, it's not going to ever be perfect, but it's, it's something you got to give, give and take with everybody. It's either that or you L Monroe. That's right. <laughs> Interesting trio for the next team here. Ole Miss, of course, the egg bowl with Mississippi state LSU and then Vandy an underrated rivalry that usually comes, comes between a, a, a tight game, fun, that, fun matchup. That when James Franklin was there produced, uh, an opening game of the season national TV deal, 39-35. Maybe the best game that's been in that stadium in about 20 years. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a good game. I mean, I, I think it's good for both of them. They're, you know, when they're having good years, they ought to be competitive enough to win the game on both sides. So, yeah, I, I think that's that's a, a good game. And, and you know, you got to start thinking about what Mississippi State's and the Mississippi's we aren't getting Alabama. We're not getting Georgia. We're not getting the one of those marquee deals. But we're thrilled. But yeah, <laughs> but you're kind of thrilled behind. Yeah. But you get to play them all in four years. I mean, yeah. you're going to play them twice in four year period, which I think is great. All right, let's go to Starkville with Mississippi State, Ole Miss, of course, Auburn, and A and M. Tough trio. That's a little tougher with that third game with Texas A and M. I don't think Texas A&M will be upset with it. Uh, and Mississippi State, you know, they've, they've got teams that at least the first two that have meant a lot to them over the years playing each other. It was either that or UL Monroe. <laughs> Poor Missouri here. Oklahoma, Arkansas, and South Carolina. Although that's not as daunting as some of those teams are down. Oklahoma's kind of a rematch, Lee, of the old Big Eight days. Yep. It is in Arkansas, of course, it keeps them in their uh, touching states. And so I think it, it gives them what they need. And once again, you're going to play the big boys probably more than you'd like to play them in the first four years. So This is really interesting here. Oklahoma, Lee's got them with three former Big 12 teams, Texas, Missouri, and Texas A&M. Say that again. Texas, Missouri, in Texas A&M for Oklahoma. Welcome to the SEC Sooners. Or back to the Big 12. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, they were used to competing against those guys. That may be an issue. There may be some more SC, one SEC flip-flop with somebody else, but uh, I, th I think that th those are good games for Oklahoma. They've been used to playing them, and they like playing Texas and Texas A&M, and maybe Missouri's a, a one that they don't understand, but it's still a game that they're used to playing over the, you know, in their past. Remember, this is Lee's best guess. Yeah. As to each school's three permanent opponents in football. Go. That's, that's 16 ADs in a room trying to decide these things. Good luck. With some yeah. gigantic egos. Yeah. South Carolina, they got Georgia, Florida, and Missouri. Florida, of course, sort of the Steve Spurrier battle. Who was the third? Missouri. Missouri. Okay. Yeah. So, Lee, a common theme here is the third game typically is easier than those those first two. Well, the third game is a game everybody's – you hope somebody's got one of their must-haves in the first two, and then the third game is just kind of filling in the rest of it. Okay, let's go up to – They don't like it, they can play FAU. No, Monroe. <laughs> it's Louisiana Monroe. Poor old UL Monroe. When was the last time they got a home game against anybody worth a damn? Well, they did beat Alabama, Nick Saban's first yes, big it loss. It was not at Monroe. No. <laughs> Let's go to – you that. Hey, Terry Bowden's still there. Don't, don't disrespect that program. Tennessee, Alabama, Kentucky, and Vandy. Makes sense. Yeah. Kentucky – is that you saying Kentucky and Tennessee is a stronger rivalry than Tennessee and Florida, Lee? Not really. I just think that that uh, it's it's a game – that's played in November and November has been always good to university of Tennessee and they may gripe about playing Vandy in Kentucky, but I'm not sure they'll be that unhappy about it. All right, let's go to Texas. Interesting list here. Lee's got them with Texas A&M, Oklahoma and Arkansas. It, it's bingo. Check Mark. Check Mark. All check right, let's mark. go. Let's go to Texas A&M. They've got Texas, Oklahoma, and Mississippi State. Two out of three are a pretty obvious check mark. Yeah. And last but not least, Vanderbilt. They got Tennessee, Kentucky, and Ole Miss. So, Lee, how many schools privately, without coming out publicly, want Vandy? Well, I mean, they've been down for a while. I think the coach is moving them up in a – very, very good way and a solid way. But, I mean, I think everybody likes to play somebody that's not quite as good as other teams. But remember what I said, everybody was fighting for Wake Forest in the ACC and they won the league and went, I think, 7-1 uh, and one in the league two years later. So you never know about that. And, you know, How Vandy underrated would the concept be that ADs want Vandy because when they play here right now, they can get all the tickets they want for their donors. Mm -hmm. Well, and yeah, and the donors love to come to Nashville. So, so it's a, it's been a good situation, but I think that'll change. I, I think some of this will make a big difference. I think that, you know, for, for Vanderbilt or anybody to have all 16 teams you play at home over a four year period is wonderful for the league. Now, whether they come up and go nine and do this, I don't know, but that's kind of a feeling that that's where they're headed. So I think it's wonderful for the league. I think it's wonderful for season ticket buyers, uh, seeing different, seeing all the teams. Right. And I think it's very good for TV because TV's getting a lot of games that they didn't used to get. Lee, let's close it out this way. Is there anything that stops this? Uh, well, I mean, they can decide we're only going to play eight schools and then they go into some crazy deal where you don't play each other for a long time. And I, I think this makes the most sense for the money and adding Oklahoma and Texas, this makes the most sense to have the most games available. And you're not getting the same games, you're getting different games against different people every four years. So I think this makes the most sense. Now we'll have to see if it comes out this way, but uh, this to me seems like is the best way to get the most money. And that's what everybody wants. 
and it's competitive and everybody gets to play everybody. So that's, that's good too. Both Watson and I thank you for doing this. Obviously coach B is going to join you um, when we start the three o'clock hour, but Lee, we do have stat of the day. And I hate to tell you this. What's that? You're going to get embarrassed with me. You're stuck. Okay, good. Excellent. Stat of the day is coming up. Then Coach Ron Bargatze and the College Basketball Insiders and a lot of talk about Tennessee's win last night at Thompson Bowling against number one ranked Alabama. Stay tuned. Hey, thank you for meeting with me today. The insurance company has made an offer. Already? Wow. They've offered you the entire policy. Thank you, Blair. You're so welcome. The Nashville Predators are having another of their college night series evenings. This one, February the 21st against the Vancouver Canucks. And guess which team it is? Yes, the Alabama Crimson Tide. Alumni, students, and fans are invited to celebrate. College Night Series ticket packages include a Predator game ticket and a limited edition co-branded hat. Tickets can be purchased at NashvillePredators.com forward slash college nights. Forget the fact that Sir Speedy Music City is owned by my BGA classmate, James Warren. Their work stands on its own merit. James and his staff do incredible work, as evidenced by the huge banners at the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. If you're looking for quality to help your marketing and business communications, and you want it at a reasonable price, these are your folks. Call them at 615-832-9511, or go to print at sirspeedymusiccity.com, and be sure to tell them Plaz sent you. Welcome to John English Antique Sports and Cards, located at 204 East Depot Street in beautiful downtown Shelbyville, Tennessee. Their phone number is area code 931-492-4304. John, obviously, I've been blown away by what I've seen at your place. I've now been there three times. But for the person who's never been, what should they expect? Well, we have a 3,000 square foot store, George. Half of it is vintage cards uh, in all sports. And then half of the store is a lot of people call it the museum where there's a lot of uh, early equipment and just the history of sports in general, baseball, football, basketball, golf, tennis, and other items. When somebody comes in there that you know is a, a big sports fan, what is their normal reaction? Well, I think that they're uh, pleasantly surprised. And, of course, being in Shelbyville, Tennessee, which is a very sm a small town that you would never expect a shop like we have to be in. Uh, so they're kind of, I don't want to say blown away, but uh, as I said, pleasantly surprised. Welcome back in. Final segment in this first hour on a Thursday afternoon. We've got Lee Fowler with us. He's going to try to help George out with stat of the day. Brought to you by John English Antique Sports and Cards. Just saw the commercial. Beautiful place out in Shelbyville, Tennessee, 204 East Depot Street. They're open during the week, Tuesday through Friday from noon to 5, and also on the weekends on Saturdays at 10 a.m., all the way through 5 o'clock. So go visit them this weekend out in Shelbyville. You can give them a call at 931-492-4304. Again, that's 931-492-4304. All right, we're going basketball. We're going into the NBA. A little historical question in the National Basketball Association. Joel Embiid has reached 10,000 career points in his 373rd career game. That's quick. That's the fewest games needed to reach that mark in Sixers history, who did he pass? Okay, Lee, let's you and I talk about it. And don't you dare gong us. I won't. Okay. 
So two that come to mind to me, Lee, would be Allen Iverson and Billy Cunningham. And didn't Dr. J play for 76ers too? Yeah, but here's here's the deal. He started in the ABA, Virginia Squires. Yep. So has reached 10,000 career points in his 373rd career game. How long did Dr. J play in the ABA? Several years. Until the money got right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, George. You, you, you. It's your show. You, you pick. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Way to take a leadership hey, position. You'd that, you'd probably take it down if it's Doctor J. <laughs> you know what? Oh, I know. And you know that's happened a few times where we'll bat around a few, and it doesn't turn out that way. So the the easy idea would be Iverson, um, but something tells me it isn't. Um, you want to pop it up there, Lee? I think Iverson makes the most sense. Let's go. Oh. Uh, what? My bad, my bad. That's in, That's inexcusable. You mean it's you right can... and he gonged you? <laughs> yeah, what the hell is that about? That's my mistake. <laughs> I mean, so in other words, what you were doing was what was... officials do. You were anticipating negativity anticipating failure. George, you're a baseball fan. You got to anticipate a bad throw. No, Lee Fowler and I do not major in failure. That's exactly right. <laughs> the fix wasn't it. It's, it's okay. Where's Coach B? I don't know, George. I'll work on that. Okay. I look forward to seeing him. Thus far, uh, he's not with us. So the concept of the college basketball insiders is for the moment – 50% complete. Yes. Lee, this is this is an inexcused absence. George, well, I'll I'll kick it off. Uh did you see the stats last night? I, I don't know what game I was watching that in the of the top 25 teams in the country that they're they're 50% dead even on the road before last night's games. And it's the worst record of top 25 teams on the road since 1943. Really? No, yeah. I did not see that. So barely winning half the games on the road from the top teams in the country. And then you can go into discussion about what's that because of that? Is it because every team's got players from different teams and, you know, they, they, they don't, we don't have the teams that are dominant. Dom, they dominate because they're talented. They don't dominate because they execute and execution with dominance, of course, creates a lot more wins on the road. It's hard to win on the road, but if you yeah. execute and have better players, you win on the road. So I thought that was really interesting, but kind of tells the tale of college basketball this year. Lee, do you think this is number one transfer portal? I think it's transfer portal, NIL. I mean, a combination of, of both. And I don't know when the movement stops because – Nothing's really changed. Well, they, you know, they have changed that the the uh, the transfer portal will be only once, and of course that remains to be seen because every time that's ever happened, then you go for your second year and you have a good reason, and everybody has a good reason, then they let them have it. Uh, the NCA does, so it'll be interesting. But I, I think as it slows down, you had the transfer, you had the you had the uh, pandemic. Got extra years. I mean, we have some kids playing uh, six years and maybe seven with injuries also. So, so that's going to slow it down. There aren't going to be as many of them. You know, I think it's it's it doesn't look good for transfers when you go two thousand on the transfer portal uh, portal and only four hundred get picked up. So that also will probably have reasoning for to slow it down because. You know, a lot of kids think they can play and should be playing and all of a sudden don't get another scholarship. So that, that'll make you think twice before you jump into that. So it may work its way out in five or six years. It just remains to be seen. Coach Ron Bargatze joins us by phone. Coach B, are you driving through a monsoon? I, I have been, but I've just come out of it. and I'm almost in my office, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join you full blast here. Okay, Lee. 
give him that stat. Uh, Ronnie, they came one of the games I was watching last night, top 25 teams in the country, uh, 51%. Of course, Alabama lost last night. Only 51% of the, the top 25 have a 500 or better uh, road record. It's the worst since 1943, they said. Uh, it's, it's just really horrible as far as the best teams in the country are concerned. And then, of course, Alabama, the number one team, lost – two to add to that. So I thought that was very interesting and you can go into a lot of reasons why you think that is. And there is coach Ron Bargatze, um, or at least about a third of him there. Uh, coach B, give me some reaction to that stat and then we'll get to Tennessee, Alabama. The, the mic, we're not hearing you, uh, coach B. It says, uh, your mic isn't connected. Oh, that's a tragedy. Which could mean mute. You may want to try to unmute uh, unmute yourself, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we may have to bring him back on by phone. Uh, we've we've got him on by phone. Okay, then let's let's sort of bring him on by phone. Okay, so Tennessee got a win last night that they desperately needed. They'd taken on a lot of water in the last couple of weeks. First of all, both of y'all's reactions to the win, and is it as simple as Tennessee out-hustled Alabama? Lee? Uh, I don't know about out-hustle. I, I thought that, you know, I've been in one of those games where you get named on Monday that you're number one team in the country, and you go into a hostile environment. So there's a lot of, lot of pressure uh, to do well, and, and I think a lot of that, of course, Tennessee's defense helped a bunch, but as the game pr uh, went longer and longer and they couldn't score and Tennessee kept them from scoring, I think it put a lot of pressure on their offense, and you hadn't seen that all year. They've always been able to get some point in the game where they make four or five threes and, and beat you on defense, and they just couldn't, ever, they couldn't get there last night, and you have to give Tennessee credit for that. Coach B., well, just look at the teams. Look at what happened to Kentucky after South Carolina embarrassed them uh, in Lexington. And now you've got Tennessee, who's had a couple of tough last-second losses. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, they dig deep and do what they did last night. That was a perfect trap game for Alabama going into the game. So do you all believe this propels Tennessee – back to where they had been, or do you think this is a moment in the sun and they will continue to struggle compared to what we saw in December up till mid-January? Coach B? Well, I, I think that there are so many teams. <laughs> Just look at – I don't think any basketball score really surprises us now, particularly on the road. So I, I just think that uh, Tennessee is very good. They're definitely a top 10 to 15 team, maybe better, but uh, they're also vulnerable like most other teams are. If they're not ready to play, they can't get their shots to fall. And they, in those two games, they didn't do a very good job of uh, stopping the ball in the last possession. Uh, they, they, they didn't score as much as they needed to. They, you know, you got to score the ball or you're not, you're vulnerable to get beat. I, I, I thought the inter very interesting game last night was Kentucky uh, Mississippi State on the road Kentucky made so many big plays winning plays in the last two minutes of that game the the, the loose ball seemed to go their way uh, it just I, th I thought that was a really good game I thought Mississippi State had a good chance to win that game and they had a big white out in Starkville they were really ready for it we'll get back to that one in a second Lee, what do you think this means for Tennessee down the road? I don't think it's changed much. I thought they were unfortunate to lose at Vandy and right behind that at home to to uh, who, who was who, uh, Auburn. Uh, no, who's the next game that beat them? Uh, Missouri. Missouri. Yes, Missouri, the same exact way. I, I think they're a very good team. I think they're a 10, somewhere between 10 and 20, and I think they'll – you know, if, when they have trouble scoring, they'll have trouble winning, especially on the road. So I'm not sure that does anything more for them than kind of solidifies them with the 
tournament people that they beat a team that's really good, and that helps you out in the end with your seeding. So Kentucky, by virtue of the win over Mississippi State, Lenardi has them now getting in barely. Coach B, it, it does seem like about once every two to three weeks, they give you an unbelievable effort. They did when they went and won in Knoxville. Last night they had their backs against the wall. But why is it that it's only once in a while? I know this college basketball world, right? We're in there right now with the NIL and the transfer portal. It's week to week, year by year. Who's available today? It's just not any, like anything we've seen in a long time. And I think when you get people moving around that much, you lose a lot of that uh, loyalty and camaraderie that develops over multiple years. So I, I'm not I'm not surprised that anybody has a look around. Look at every team in the top 10 to 15. They, they come up with a really disappointing game. Look at Purdue. Uh, look at Tennessee. Look at all these teams that are great one night and not so great the next. It, it's crazy. And the three-point basket. And the three-point basket also uh, plays into that whole thing. Lee, wh what do you think Calipari's thinking these days? Because this does seem like the first time that he only gets this effort once every two, once every three weeks. The rest of the time, you don't know what the hell you're getting out of them. Yeah, and I think it has a lot to do with the same thing at the Tennessee. It, when they score the basketball, that encourages them on defense and and, you know, that, that stat that I told you earlier about 51% winning percentage for good teams on the road, it probably goes much deeper than that. Teams that aren't in the top 25 are winning less than 50% of their games. So I think, you know, Ronnie can remember back, we, we knew at Vanderbilt if we could, we could win most of our home games, if we could go 500 on the road, we had a chance. And that was a team that was trying to get to the tournament, didn't have as many opportunities. But I think, that formula now gets you in the NCAA tournament. If you win your home games, you know, might lose one or two and then win on the road 50% or close, then you're going to get in the NCAA tournament and you're a pretty good basketball team. And I, I think that's what you're looking at at Kentucky. And Tennessee's a little bit better because they defend you every game. So they win a few more, but that's the struggle, I think, that's going on in college basketball right now. That's your cue, Coach B. Well, when I look around at the world of college basketball now, things I've just said leading up to this, uh, there's more uncertainty than, than you can ever remember. I mean, look at look at Western Kentucky. This is not Western Kentucky that we've known for a lot of years. Uh, look at Austin P. They barely have a couple wins in the conference. They moved to a downtown arena. Uh, it's, it's just a really tough world out there, and lots of Lots of surprises every night. I'm almost not surprised at anybody winning the game, particularly if, uh, if they're at home. Okay, I want to get I want to get both of y'all to talk to me about A and M. When I look at them, the the sum of the parts to me doesn't equal the outstanding conference record they've got. Now, there's no doubt Buzz Williams can coach. They ought to play CZ Top at his games, sharp-dressed man, because he is. But what is the secret down there? I don't know. Defense, I would say, was, is the biggest secret. And they score just enough to beat people. And they come every night. He brings it every night to the to the game. And, you know, he's he's one of those guys that gets you to play hard every game. And they play good enough defense to keep themselves in the game and make just enough offensive plays to, to win games. And, you know, it's not a hard formula, but it's not pretty. And you don't quite see how they can do it uh, through a SEC schedule, but they're definitely doing it. That's your cue. <laughs> well, hey, let's get a specific about – we're talking a lot of generalities, George. You generally – are on a couple of points, you know, and the conversations that we have off the show, you can get pretty spicy. I, I want to hear some of your opinions. Some of my opinions. Wow. Come on, get spicy, George. Okay. 
I don't know how the hell a and doing it. I watch them, and I don't see it. I just don't see it. I know that this guy can really coach, and that's a big piece of it. And Lee's right. They bring it every night. They've got this work, you know, uh, work pale kind of mentality that they bring. But I look at some other teams, and I'm like, they got more talent. How many threes does A&M make? Not very many. But yeah, yeah, I think they're – I think that's probably athletically. I think they're as good as anyone, but I think knocking down three-point baskets uh, has such a deep effect on the outcome of games. And I don't think they. There's not a very good three-point shooting team. Okay, I want to get both of y'all on a subject that, in the last week, has taken a dramatic turn. If if I'm now looking for a coach, and I don't think Texas is anymore. I think the interim's going to get that job. But there are other big jobs that will come open. They always do. Coach B, a name that's never out there. But in the last week, he beat Purdue. Last night, he ripped into Indiana. Chris Collins at Northwestern. Doug Collins' son. This guy's got it going. I'll tell you what, they're, they're a tough out. They they do so many little things well. I'm just uh, I'm I'm pretty amazed at what they've been able to do. That and and you know that the genes in that family are pretty strong. And you know I think he likes it there, George. I, I don't I don't you know he might leave, but I think he's the kind of coach that wants to to continue building it there. Uh, because did he play there? No, I don't he know. played at Duke. Yeah, he's a chef. Uh, right. right. He, he's a Duke guy. Now, Lee, let me ask this, though. It's always going to be a struggle at Northwestern, regardless of what they do this year. That is never an easy deal. Doesn't he have to sit there right now and go, I am hot, it's time to go? You know, I don't know. That's He's he's such a basketball family with his dad and, and coming up through Coach K, and there were a lot of opportunities for him to leave as an assistant be a head coach at a lot of places, and he stayed at Duke. So so I'm not sure that he's one of those guys. I mean, he probably enjoys what he does. It's it's going to the office every day and, and teaching and being a teacher. And so I think Northwestern probably is a pretty good fit for him with his Duke background. So uh, he's definitely not a guy that's going to be looking for a place that just, you know, wants to spend money and wants to win at all costs. And – uh, he, he wants his own environment. I know Chris, uh, during the days he was at Duke, and I'm not sure he's going to jump in there like a lot of guys would because he thinks it's a you know, tough job at Northwestern. I think he likes that kind of situation. Okay, Coach B, let me, let me toss it a different way. I wouldn't want John Shire's job. Anybody? Coach was that, B, was that a lightning bolt? <laughs> What just happened? I'm sitting in a sunroom that's not sunny right now. <laughs> no, I believe that. I'm looking out uh, out my window, and, and I'm seeing the same thing you are. Coach B, I wouldn't want Shire's job. To me, this is replacing Bear Bryant. This is what somebody will face when they replace Nick Saban. And so three years from now, if it doesn't work, isn't Chris Collins number one on that list? He's got to be high on the list, but uh, there's a guy that went to, from Memphis to UCLA one time and found out what it's like to replace a legend. It's difficult. It's almost impossible. Gene, Gene Bartow and I had several conversations while he was at UCLA, and he said, I knew it would be tough, but not anything like it is. By the way, have either one of you watched before we go to the break, the SEC's uh, SEC Network seven-part series, History of SEC Basketball. I've seen one and two. I didn't see three. Yeah, me too. Uh, one and two, but didn't get to see three. Coach B, what about you? Well, Lee, uh, we didn't make much of an impact on that 70s era. I don't know. No. I guess they forgot about us. <laughs> 
Yeah, it was a different, it was a different, it's always according to who's producing those things is whether you get any play in there, but we had a pretty good impact in the early 70s, all the way to 76 and 77. So, but anyway, it is what it is. And, and uh, they were real kind to us in the 60s. And um, um, so, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's good to look back at that history and see what was going on. And there have been some film in it that I've recognized people in South Oh, people. yeah. That, that's the part that's uh, been interesting is the old film footage. Yeah. For those hey, back. George? Yeah. Uh, what, when people are replacing coaches, we're, we were talking about that a little bit. You know, I think one of the safest things uh, an athletic director can do in replacing a coach is look at the pedigree and from what tree, coaching tree, that these potential candidates come from. I think that's one of the best uh, measuring sticks that you can have. Uh, someone who's come up through the ranks and have played for a coach that really, you know, I mean, like you know, Rick Bird is one of those guys that people really respect the guys who played for him or coached with him uh, to move on to another job. Uh, of course, Mike Krzyzewski, Bob Knight. Uh, if you go back to a, a lot of the guys that were X and O tacticians, and I, I'd say that's a good thing to look for if you're trying to hire a coach. You know, that's true. And you know who has a great tree? It's probably 10 or 12 is Herb Sendak. And, of course, he came out of Patino's tree. But he's got a bunch of guys, a Xavier coach and Drake coach. And there are a lot of guys that have been successful. And, you know, that you're right, Ronnie. I think that, you know, they may not like it, but they see it every day of what you have to do to be successful. And, and uh, I was going to say something, ask something to Ronnie, and we may have to take a break. But Ronnie, Go ahead and do it. The thing that's changed so much, I feel like, is is how do you build a program? How do you hire somebody when the transfer is different? The 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 NIL, and you don't do it. You're not involved in that, or you are involved. I mean, it, it's it's so much different now than what ten years ago. You knew what it would take for Vanderbilt to be good in basketball. Uh, 10 years ago, you knew what it would take for, for Texas to be good in basketball. But now, what does it take and how do you, how do you play the guys leaving and coming in? And I mean, it, it's such a different world. I think the athletic directors are really dealing with a crystal ball at this point because of all those things. And Ronnie, did, did you have lightning over there the way you jumped? <laughs> I thought I thought maybe you had seen George and I the first time if we'd come on the screen or something. <laughs> the way you jumped. <laughs> Not a pretty you picture. There are two things that can disarm you. One is lightning and one is a golf cart. Yes. Oh, golf cart will yeah. definitely get you. No question that, about that. That especially, would be called an inside joke. Yeah, especially don't chase it down, Ronnie, after you lose it. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do this. Let's do this. We'll go to the break, and then we're going to show you Joe Lenardi's most recent stuff that he put out. I think it was a couple of days ago, and then he'll update it again probably Friday. But we'll get these guys' reaction to what Lenardi is saying because, let's face it, when Lenardi says it, it's pretty close to 100% right. Stay tuned. How am I going to get to work? My car is totaled. The scholar our team is making a call right now. We'll get you a rental car. Don't worry. That's a relief. Call us 24-7. We're here. We're going to help. As the trusted premier custom home builder in Middle Tennessee, Donley Timmons has over 20 years of experience in the industry. Whether you're looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client and every remodel is unique, luxurious, and completed on time within budget. Founders Dustin Timmons and Joey Donley have over 25 years of construction experience in the Nashville area. Together, they have completed projects in Forest Hills, Oak Hill, 
Green Hills, Franklin, and Brentwood. Dustin and Joey believe that communication is the most important aspect of all construction projects. Therefore, they personally manage each project themselves and are involved in job site activities on a daily basis. Their commitment to quality and integrity has earned them an outstanding reputation among their clients. Contact them to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects. Give them a call at 615-456-7983 or log on to DonleyTimmons.com. Year number two of the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night was awesome. And the reason is really simple. I chose Strike and Spare, and they were amazing. They have great food, great bowling, and a staff that is truly ready to go the extra mile to help you. They have five family fun centers in the area to choose from. And for more info, go to strikeandspare.com or call them at 615 615- Okay, we're back, and in just a few moments, the college basketball insiders will be shown Lenardi's stuff. That's Lee Fowler on the right. Coach B may well have been struck by lightning (laughs) and has zapped out. Uh, Billy, is he just... We've still got him by phone. We've got him by phone. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Coach B, you there? Yes, sir. Excellent. Okay, I want you all to talk me through... What's going on at Vandy? Because all of this comes after they got beat by 57 at Alabama. Something happened, starting with Liam Robbins, who now looks like Will Purdue. Yeah, I mean, I think we talked about it a while ago. Kentucky gets beat by South Carolina. Tennessee gets beaten on last-second buzzer beaters. And then uh, you see what they did to Alabama last night. So. That's just the, the psyche of college basketball. Well, okay, Lee, go. Well, I think the I think the big thing, George, is Vandy, Vandy can score. And there, there are a lot of teams in the SEC, and especially in the bottom part, that just really struggle scoring. And I think they've got on a good run now, and they're making shots and feeling good about themselves. And, the, you know, he's got a rotation going. And, and, and I think that, that that is is this is a great time of year to be healthy and also believing you can score some points and and they always have played pretty good defense but I I think they they score the ball as good as about you know they're fifth or sixth in the league as far as being able to shoot the ball in when they're open. I made the joke earlier this week that Liam Robbins in the last week has made more money than I'll make in the rest of my life. Coach B, let me start with you. Is he drafted on the first, uh, you know, it's now a two round draft. Does he get drafted? I do think he gets drafted. And uh, I think, first of all, when you look at him play, he's a very enthusiastic, positive sort of a guy. He can shoot it from outside. He rebounds the ball, crashes the boards. Well, I I think that, uh, I think I would. I'm 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 hesitant to say this, but I think I would draft him ahead of Sheboy because of his possible perimeter game. Yeah, I think the same thing. I think his ability to stretch the defense is what the NBA wants, and he makes open shots. And you got to go guard him, and they want the middles cleaned out. And so, I think he'll have a chance to to play at the next level. And you know, it'll be up to him whether he NBA's or goes to Europe or whatever, but he definitely has worked him way, his way into being one of the better big guys in the country, I think. So, Coach B, you brought up Sheboy, and that's a really interesting comment you've made. A year ago, no matter how bad things were, he was automatic. 
he was going to be good for 25 points and anywhere from 14 to 18 rebounds a game. He was just completely a stat stuffer. But it looks to me like teams have figured out a book on what to do with him. Talk to me about that book. Well, first of all, uh, you don't fear him facing up to the basket and shooting over you. You face him down low, back to the basket, drawing the foul, getting the uh, old-fashioned three, or dunking on top of you. Uh, that's not the case with Robbins. Robbins can face up to the basket and score. He can score with his back to the basket. He's got a lot of enthusiasm. He's got kind of a, what I'd call uh, boyhood type enthusiasm about him. And I, I'm like you, Justin. I think he's made a lot of money over the past month since he came back from his last injury. And Lee, think, Lee, what do you think? What do you think's going on with Sheboy? Well, I think Georgia, they don't have the two guys that can make threes. So all of a sudden you can help out off those other guys. So I think he's getting a lot more attention. He couldn't get it a couple of years before when they had guys that were really playing well around him. So when teams struggle to score, then, then the big guy gets hurt worse because people are going to help out on him and dive down his lap. And I think that's what's happened to him. And then you start doubting yourself. And so, so I think, I mean, he's an unbelievable rebounder, but scoring, if he gets help, used to kick it out. Somebody they'd make the three, so you'd quit helping. Now, now they jump down on him, they pick it out and they miss the shot. So, you know, it has a lot to do people. When people score, everybody thinks the offense is wonderful. When they don't score, everybody thinks the offense is not very good offense. Well, it's the same offense. Just when they go in, when they go, it's all going in, boy, everybody looks great. Right. You can play well, but not shoot the ball well. And then you can shoot the ball well and not really play well. So shooting doesn't always correlate with good offense. But don't you all think that that's maybe a little of the issue right now in college basketball? We've gone too much athleticism and not enough shooting. There's no question there's not as many people, and Ronnie can tell you, uh, you know, we worked on fundamentals. I don't think they work on fundamentals. They work on free throw shooting only because people talk about it on TV so much that they have to because they're shooting so poorly. But fundamentals are not what they once were. You don't have a guy and teach him from his freshman year up to his senior year. So I think everything hurts a little bit, and that hurts execution. That hurts guys getting open looks. That, that hurts a lot of things. And I think that's what we're seeing in college basketball. So y'all ready to uh, either see or hear Lenardi's stuff? Yeah, I'd, I'd also like to say something about Lenardi. I like Joe, known him Joe since I was basketball committee stuff. But trust me, you know, this stuff is – my brother and I got in a big argument the other night <laughs> about about Lenard, Lenardi saying UNC was in the tournament. He's going, they're horrible, they shouldn't be. I said, Doug, they're one of the best teams in the country. They're just not playing well. I said, and Lenardi, how do you think he gets attention? He gets attention by UNC not being in, by Kentucky not being in. So all this stuff is all about PR and making him money. And, and yes, at the end of the day, he gets them right because, but he does it like every day is the end of the day. And so he's playing the game in and out and all that sort of stuff. And and I could tell you right now, and he said, okay, Joe, is in, UNC going to get in at the end? He'd say, yeah, they're going to get in. And because, I mean, they can win the thing. They're good enough to win the thing. In Kentucky, not so much, but they're going to be in the tournament. And, and so some of that stuff just uh, gripes me that he's always playing day-to-day -day about who's in and who's out. Coach B, if they end up in the NIT, Southern Illinois will be their initial opponent. <laughs> yeah, you can bet on that. Well, how'd they get that draw? Oh, I, I don't know. So, Billy, you want to read the SEC ones first? Yep. And let's get these guys to comment on him. And I'm asking you to do that because I don't think Coach B can see this stuff. No, he can't. I got you, Coach B. Uh, let's start with, at the top, Alabama is a one seed. And then we've got, we're kind of going reverse order here, but Auburn is a 10 seed right now. They've got Vandy this Saturday night. Missouri is a seven seed. Arkansas is a nine seed. Tennessee is a three seed, so they stayed at that three line after beating Alabama. Texas A&M right now is a 10 seed. Even after beating Arkansas last night, 
Uh, so that's a little bit of a mystery potentially, but Mississippi State and Kentucky are both last four in. Okay, let's stop there. Lee, give me a thought on what you just saw. I mean, I think it's pretty, yeah, pretty normal. I, I think that uh, I think A and M, if they keep winning, is going to be higher than a ten seed. Uh, Mississippi State last four in. I mean, I, I have hopes that Vandy could get in if they keep winning. Uh, if they beat Auburn Saturday night, they've got the exact same record and will will have beaten them. So there's other teams I think still have a chance, but I think w- where he's got them right now is is exactly where they'll end up. Okay, what do you think it would take? I mean, you've been the chairman of of one of these committees. What do you think it would take for Vandy to get in? Well, be above 500 in the league because they've won late. Remember, they lost some games with with the big guy out, and he's kind of dominant now. And if he keeps dominating, you got to look back and say, well, a couple of those losses they had with him sitting out two weeks, maybe they wouldn't have lost. So I, I think that that's an opportunity for them. And then I think when they get to the SEC tournament, they've got to win a couple games, get the semis or maybe the final game. And I think they would have a chance because that puts them at 18 or 19 wins. And most of it, you know, late in the year when they were playing conference foes. So there's still a chance. And four games ago, we would not have thought that. But now I think there's a chance if they keep playing and keep winning. It's as I've told you, George, and you always like this. Winning's good and losing's bad. Yes, losing <laughs> sucks. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Coach B, give me some reaction. Well, my reaction is that Vandy is a lot better team with a little shorter bench. And I think everybody knows their roles better than they did. And I think that plays into why they're stronger now than they've been all year. And all of a sudden, they've got some losses that look a lot better now. Like that Pitt game, they beat Pitt early and they're – top team in the ACC right now. Look at Tennessee. Vandy just beat that Tennessee team that, that just beat number one Alabama. So all of a sudden, you get, look back at some of these wins for Vandy and their strength of schedule is one of the best in the country. So that might that might help them too. Yep. Coach B, keep going. Uh, I, you know, I think Mississippi State is a little bit of a dark horse. I think their upside is a little bit better than a couple of the other teams in the league. Uh, we don't hear and see as much of them, but but I, I thought they're pretty athletic. They had a pretty good inside game last night. Uh, they they didn't really control the they didn't really control the uh, boards like I thought they might uh, down the stretch, and I think that hurt them last night. But uh, we know that Arkansas is either a feast or famine type team, but uh, they're capable of beating anyone. I I kind of like where they are. Uh, they're number nine. Don't don't have already had them on the nine. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think outside of Alabama, I think any of any of these SEC teams could be beaten. Uh, you know, I've I've been watching the Missouri Valley, and I see some. I see three or four teams in there that scare you to death the way they control the ball, very well coached. Uh, I mean, Drake is one of the best coach teams I've seen all year. And I'll tell you, probably one of the most uh, underrated coaches in the country now because he hadn't been there in name recognition. But Casey Alexander can flat coach the game. Coach B, you know as well as I do, one of the things hurting the Missouri Valley right now is the fact that the Mountain West is likely to get five. And that five is taking one, maybe two away from the Missouri Valley. Well, the, the Valley teams are, are not overpowering, particularly in the low post, uh, which which I think is going to play well. Point guards and low post players, I think, have to really carry their load to advance in the tournament. Uh, but uh, it'll be interesting to see. There, none of these teams won't play uh, Drake or Indiana State right now. They're, they're awfully good teams. Or Belmont. For that matter. Yeah, Drake and Bradley right now are both 13 and 4. SIU, Belmont, Indiana State are all 12 and 5. Mm. So, Billy, run through the the other part of the list that I put together. Gotcha. So we're taking a look at some of the mid-major uh, potentials here. 
Moorhead State right now is listed as a 16 seed. So they, uh, they're they looking to get in, obviously, win their conference. OVC. Yep. FAU is a nine seed right okay, now. Their stop. head coach, Dusty May, has done a phenomenal job. Coach B, I hope I'm wrong about this because I certainly don't want to see this happen to Kermit. But I keep hearing this guy at FAU will end up at Ole Miss. Well, I've heard the same thing. As a matter of fact, this morning I was in a conversation with a uh, coach that knows – the leagues around here very well. And, uh, he mentioned that to me and I, I hadn't heard that, but, uh, I, I'd say that, uh, Kermit probably is, you know, we all really care for him and like him a lot, but, uh, he's probably on the hottest seat of anyone around here. Yeah. Keep going, Billy. After that, we've got Liberty as a 12 seed. Their head coach, I always forget his name. Uh, does a, does a great job. Richie McKay. Richie McKay. Richie McKay. Yeah. And by the way, Lipscomb just got through beating them about a week and a half ago. Big win for Lenny Acuff. Huge win. Another in-state team here, Memphis, a team that beat Vanderbilt to begin the season. They're kind of sitting around that 11 seed spot. They're, they're hanging in. They can't afford uh, too many losses down the stretch here. Lee, why are they struggling to get in? Uh, just because of issues, I think. Uh, they, they play up and down, but they play Houston twice before the end of the year. That either is going to help them or hurt them. And another thing, George, looking at that list, you got we talked about Vanderbilt, what they need to do. Luckily for them, they've got they've got wins over Tennessee and Arkansas of teams that are in the tournament. They've got still left games against Mississippi State, Kentucky, uh, and Auburn, who are supposedly in the tournament. So they have a chance. Everything's to in front. Play well and win. To, to have a chance that some teams don't have at this point. Billy, what's the uh, what's the prognosis on Castleton? Got hurt. Castleton might be out for the season. Yeah, that is a death blow. At Florida? Florida. And it was kind of a fluke. It, it, he hit his hand. His hand collided with somebody else's hand, I think. Man, I hate to see that. Yeah, it's yeah. a wrist injury. <laughs> okay, y'all leave me with this. Your thoughts on Tennessee, Kentucky at Rupp Saturday – your thoughts on Vandy Auburn at Memorial Gym, probably as big a game as, as Stackhouse has had since he's been here. Lee, start with you. Well, I, yeah, I think a, a big game that with positive vibes coming in. I think you're exactly right, George. I, I'm hoping there'll be a good crowd. I'm going to be there. I know you will be, and hopefully Ronnie will be there. It's it's uh, The Kentucky-Tennessee game is is will be a war, just like the other game was. And I couldn't tell you who will win, but in most cases, the home team seems to be winning more than than losing. So I'd have to go with Kentucky at home. Coach B, uh, I, I don't. I think that uh, Auburn is a really fun, interesting, different kind of team. Uh, you never know who's going to be on the front line for them uh, in scoring. They, they uh, but you know, they never stop playing hard. And that's a, you know, Bruce Pearl does not allow his team to lack an effort for sure. And uh, so I think Vandy is a very slight underdog in that game and uh, and maybe even a picket game. Uh, Tennessee, I still think they're going to have a hard time going on the road and uh, and, and winning in rough. I, I, I think Kentucky's going to win that game. They had, they had nobody swept that series in a long time. It, they've they've been a split. Nobody has swept it, the other team in a while. So Kentucky's got that shot. Mm -hmm. Guys, thank you both. This was good stuff today. Thank you, George. We didn't. We, let's, let me back, let me bow out here by saying that we've talked about different coaches. Lenny Acuff is another guy that's as good as there is around, and uh, great guy. And and he does what a what a wonderful job he does coaching his team. Belmont and Lipscomb, really fortunate in what they have. Correct. Good administrators, George. It always comes down to that, doesn't it, Lee? Well, it does in the end. <laughs> they usually fire them if it doesn't work. So, uh -huh. NC State's, they're, they're rolling too yeah, right now. They're, they, play, uh... they play the Tar Heels Sunday at home. Mm. Yeah. We'll be watching. Yes, sir. Guys, thank you both. Thank Good you. Good stuff. Thank you. Those are the College Basketball Insiders. We thank them for being with us. We'll go to the break, and then let me just say it the way it is. I'm in fuego.
I'm red hot. Plaster yeah. bet of the day. Another W. A gift to the people is coming up next. <laughs> Hey, thank you for meeting with me today. The insurance company has made an offer. Already? Wow. They've offered you the entire policy. Thank you, Blair. You're so welcome. The Nashville Predators are having another of their College Night Series evenings. This one, February the 21st against the Vancouver Canucks. And guess which team it is? Yes, the Alabama Crimson Tide. Alumni, students, and fans are invited to celebrate. College Night Series ticket packages include a Predator game ticket and a limited edition co-branded hat. Tickets can be purchased at NashvillePredators.com forward slash college nights. Forget the fact that Sir Speedy Music City is owned by my BGA classmate, James Warren. Their work stands on its own merit. James and his staff do incredible work, as evidenced by the huge banners at the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. If you're looking for quality to help your marketing and business communications, and you want it at a reasonable price, these are your folks. Call them at 615 615- 832-9511 or go to print at sirspeedymusiccity.com and be sure to tell them Plaz sent you. Jody Jones has as nice a dental facility as you'll find anywhere. Let's go in and take a look. Are you in the market for a new dentist? Maybe you're new to Nashville? Well, the place to go is Jody Jones Dentistry at 55 Music Square East. And their new facility is absolutely state-of-the-art. Jody mixes quality with comfort for the perfect dental experience. He's trusted for his creative design and committed to both the function and aesthetics of your smile. Jody is simply the total package. Don't wait. Make an appointment now at 615-259-5100. The Nashville Predators are having another of their College Night Series evenings. This one, February the 21st against the Vancouver Canucks. And guess which team it is? Yes, the Alabama Crimson Tide. Alumni, students, and fans are invited to celebrate. College Night Series ticket packages include a Predator game ticket and a limited edition co-branded hat. Tickets can be purchased at NashvillePredators.com forward slash college nights. Boy, how about this weather, George? Good Lord, I looked outside a few minutes ago, and it was pouring. Man, we now get... it's lightened up considerably. We're getting little pockets of this. Mm-hmm. Probably, well, you know, now that you've forced me to... Forced your hand a little bit here. Yeah. Tornado watch, by the way, until 7 p.m. in Davidson County. For those of you who are watching this live... Um, so we need to sort of buckle down tonight. Looks like the rain stops around midnight and then turns considerably colder. Hmm. So hopefully it gets a little bit better. Yeah. But it was really coming down. But before we end the show, we've got bed of the day brought to you by Bart Durham Injury Law. They are lawyers you can trust. Give them a call at 615-242-9000. Again, that's 615-242-9000 or log on to bartdurham.com. All right, let's check out what happened last night. And George, Vandy and Tennessee, you have bet on them this week, and they've really come home for you big time. Oh, yeah. And they really haven't proven to be reliable 
in in the betting department this season. Let me tell you something. Nobody is reliable. Yeah. Lee stat is really eye opening. I go against it tonight. I'll tell you a game it is, but I go against his stat. But man, when you hear that, you realize why Vegas is mopping up right now in college hoops. Yeah, and there's there's a reason, George. I mean, there are a lot of people wondering why Tennessee was favored last night. Vegas knew something, and and you knew it as well. I think a lot I of people thought I knew it. I mean, a lot of people might have seen it coming. Yeah. Did they really deep down though? Uh, who knows? Alabama's pretty good. They are. Tennessee's pretty good. They really buckled down. We got Griff tomorrow. Yes, we do. Okay, looking, looking forward. forward to that. So, I'm taking Purdue. Purdue let one slip away at Northwestern. They had total control of that game and gagged it late. Maryland has been an improving team under my buddy Kevin Willard. And this isn't going to be easy. But in the end, the big guy, nobody's got an answer for Zach Eady. He's going to be the college player of the year. And at seven foot four inches tall, when they get in trouble, that's who they go to. Either Maryland wins this in double digits or Purdue wins. Well, so there's no in-between. There's no in-between. Minus one and a half. Yeah. The, Question the, is, Maryland for Maryland to win, I think they have got to hit Purdue early with a Mack truck. If this game stays close, Purdue's going to win because of Zach Eady. Yeah, and you feel like they need it to stay on that one seed line at yeah. least confidently because if they lose another road game like this to a you know sort of an average uh Big 10 team that they may not be on that one side any longer. I've come to the conclusion that there are three teams in the country who may be truly on the one line. Purdue, Houston, Bama. After that it's who it's, knows? A, it's a who's who. Who knows. Okay, Mark Griffin tomorrow during the 2 o'clock hour. And then Coach Herm Edwards at 3 o'clock. Mm. And that right there is worth the price of admission. No doubt. Dodge the raindrops. We'll see you tomorrow.